Okay, okay, so with that being said, you played point guard before turning to coaching, stating that you were a big Magic Johnson fan because he made his teammates better in a fun way. This basically meant that you grew up a Lakers fan before you got the Clippers job. Before we hop into your days before coaching, we got to know one thing, and we asked T-Man the same question when he came on the pod, and he said it felt like a movie. Can you walk us through the atmosphere leading up to and during the Battle of L.A. opening night 2019, which was the first matchup between the AD LeBron Lakers and the new look Clippers. Oh God, God, that was a long time ago. Um, I mean, I think we still, we handled business. That's all our, I mean, I'm sorry. I just, we always beat the Lakers like with under Doc Rivers and then T. Lou. I mean, we had the cheat code. I mean, T. Lou had LeBron in, in Cleveland. So it was definitely more, um, I guess for the fans, the LA fans, and we knew it was going to be an entertainment game, but I just remember the coaches saying like, Hey, this is business. You know, this is not a show. And, um, you know, we handled them. So I remember, um, just exciting, but at the end of the day, like beating the Lakers is not winning a championship. So it was just another game. Yeah, so staying on the topic of L.A., we know you uh, started as a walk-on at UCLA and eventually became a three-year starter, but doing a little deeper dive in your collegiate stats, your last season at UCLA, you, you earned an honorable mention in the Pac-10 selection. You're also seventh on UCLA's all-time season assist list, but it seems as your favorite opponent was always Washington State, seeing on how you have your career high in points, rebounds, and three-pointers all against the Cougars. Did they spite you in some way that always got you to turn up against them, or uh, what's that about? No, just unfortunately, I think about if I remember clearly that they just weren't very good defensively. Like, I just want to be honest. Um, you know, I think they were one of the lower ranked teams at the time. Uh, the gym was very old school. I don't know if you guys been there, but it's like kind of like a high school a atmosphere. Like, it's pretty old. I do remember there was like flies coming down from the roof uh, during shoot around. So it's just kind of like that old school feel. It doesn't feel like like a show. Um, again, I think, again, I, I think I credit more to the defense and for my performance. And again, I mean, for me, stats, I mean, you could tell like stats is not a big deal for me. I mean, I just wanted to win. Same thing as I do now. So, so you just had their defensive scheme figured out and you were just really comfortable in the gym. Is that why you think? I think it was just my matchup. And I just, I just honestly, I can't remember at this point. Um, like it's crazy when I talk to athletes and some of our players of how they remember every little detail. I guess I was probably coaching like more when I was playing at that time. Cause I remember like the floor, I remember the gym. I remember like little things like that rather than my individual stats. So, yeah. So you're a pretty good pro player as well overseas in Germany, but unfortunately you had an injury kind of derailed you started coaching women's team in Germany. Then you became an assistant in the Japanese league mm -hmm. where you're promoted the first female head coach of a men's team in Japanese history. Now, you've obviously spent a lot of time around the Japanese League and over in the States, the NBA, the WNBA. What would you say is the biggest difference between the styles of play and the atmosphere, just the overall feel of the game? From Japan to the women's? Is that what you guys are asking? Just Japan to America in general. Um, you know, it's funny, just the more I spent time there, the more I learned about my own culture. I mean, I'm Japanese-American. And, you know, it was kind of... I guess just new to me was the players were very respectful, but it it kind of clouded their little bit of their individual performance where they would have a little bit of a confidence issue. Um, they would when they miss shots, they would look over and I'd have to like just say, you know, keep shooting, keep, keep, keep working at it, like because they thought, I think back when they said they're in high school and college, like they would get hit with like a ruler from their coach if like they missed a shot. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to do that to you guys. Like, you know, I'm, I'm going to support, you know, makes, misses, whatever, as long as we, you know, we play together and we win. So um, for me, that was a little shocking when I actually, like, eventually got to learn a, a deeper relationship with some of the players. So really pushing the individual, like, play and then end of the game stuff. I will never forget this. One of our guys who, who was Japanese, he could shoot the living shit out of the ball. And I told him like, hey, man, I'm going to draw this end of the gameplay for you. And he was like, no. He's like, I don't want it. I was like, you're on fire. I'm like, I want to draw it for you. And he was just like, no. And then I drew it for one of our Americans. And then I went back and said, look, 
be ready. Um, I'm going to draw like end of the game uh, situations for you. And then eventually he did. He, he had the courage and he won us the game. So, yeah. Yeah. So a year later, you landed an unpaid internship, internship, excuse me, with the Clippers video room, turning it into a full-time job. And several of the NBA's top coaches started their careers in the same way in the video room, to name a few, like Coach Eric Spolstra, Mike Budenholzer, Frank Vogel, and Mike Brown. Now, you started in the Vinny Del Negro era, and then you stayed in Doc's tenure and Ty Lue's, creating relationships with players like CP3, Blake Griffin, Paul Pierce, and others. And at 34 in 2014, you became the first female to sit among assistant coaches on the bench in the summer league. Can you talk to us about how you landed the Clippers gig and tell our listeners about the Vinny Del Negro grabbing your notes story when you first got to the, <laughs> to the Clippers? Let me applaud you guys for doing your research. Wow. I'm highly impressed. Like you guys are like word for word in like some of my stories. Um, I mean, to keep it pretty short, uh, I mean, I, I remember wanting to, you know, be in the NBA. I was, I was learning under a, a former NBA coach, Bob Hill in Japan, uh, who gave me my first opportunity. And when he uh, had his practice plans and his schemes and the way he wanted to prepare for a game, it was unreal. Like it was stuff that I've never heard of in terms of language terminology like I was like whatever he knows I want to know I was obsessed and then um, so when I told that to my dad I said look I want to work in the NBA like I want to know exactly what he knows and he's like well he's like the NBA is in the United States of America he's like I'm going to need you to move back and I and I enjoyed my time in Japan though you know I was still young um, just enjoying like learning different cultures but he's like no move back so I did what my dad said. I moved back. Not I had didn't have a job, um, but I've learned from Bob. Like you got to reach out to as many connections as you can that you have with NBA, which I had zero. Um, so Bob was the one who was like just trying to do everything and anything, but he couldn't get a sniff of anything. And so this is so random, but a, a friend of mine who I was training, um, her name's Allison Taka. She said, "I'm going to go to the Clippers facility for this coaches clinic," and I said you're going to do what, you know, I was like, what? And this was like really close to the beginning of the Clippers season. Like the training camp was like a month away and I had no job. And she said, you want to go? And I was like, yeah, because Bob Hill told me, you know, anytime you have an opportunity to step into the facility, like an NBA facility, you do it. And, you know, I drive by the Clippers facility all the time and you just sit there and hope and pray like somebody would open the door or something like that. But so I went in and I walked in and one of the Clippers coaches was running the clinic at the time. And he said, hey, welcome to Youth Coaches Clinic. And I'm like, youth coaches? And I was like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? Um, so we just did, you know, real fundamental drills. And then he actually made us do the workout. And so when I was sitting there doing the ball handling drill, he was like, hey, he goes, did you play or something? Because you can handle the ball. I said, yeah, I played at UCLA, da, 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 da. And then after, you know, I've learned like never – never hesitate on a moment of an opportunity. So after he was like, y'all have any questions? And I, I raised my hand like five times. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I'm like, what does CP do? What does Blake do? And then after when the clinic was over, I pulled him, I went up to him um, on the side and I said, hey, you know, you're talking about CP's workouts. I'm like, would it be okay if I email you tonight and possibly like ask you a couple of questions? And he said, sure, why not? So he gave me his email address, go home. I hit him like, hey, can I, like come to a workout and just observe, you know, cause that's how I got the job in Japan. And um, yeah, within five minutes, he hit me back and said, yeah, he's like, see you tomorrow at 10. And I just started jumping like out of, out of my seat. Like just, I was going nuts. I was like, oh my God, I'm about to go see CP and Blake work out. And sure enough, I, you know, brought my notes, you know, always bring your notes, always, you know, um, write down as much as you can, what you're learning. And just, I just kept coming. I'm like, hey, can I keep coming? Can I keep coming? And they're like, yeah. They're like, why not? And then, I mean, two weeks go by and they're like, what do you want? <laughs> I'm like, do you guys have a video intern position open? And the video guy um, at the time was like, we might. And I'm like, that's all I needed to hear. Um, and then I was sitting there. I remember it's so funny though. I think it was either Blake or DJ, I can't remember, but they, after like seeing them every day, they're like, are you a news reporter? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I was like, no, I got, I'm just here just to watch and learn, you know? And um, so I sit there on a table and then Vinny Negro, who didn't come down often, you know, he let the other like player development coaches coach and he came down and he just didn't say hi or anything. He just 
slammed his hand against my notepad when I was sitting there at the desk. And then he read it and he was like, he's like, Dan, he's like, you're taking like really good notes. He's like, you're actually learning. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like, I'm not missing this opportunity. And he's like, I heard you wanted to be our video intern. And I just looked up to him like in my mind, like praying. I'm like, just say yes, just say yes. And he goes, you're hired. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I was like, great. And I just, you know, I remember calling my best friend, went home and I just celebrated, had some Mexican food and margaritas and I was ready to go. So. So what were some of the biggest differences that you noticed between Vinny and Doc's coaching styles? Uh, well, it was hard with Vinny because I was only with Vinny for a year. Um, so I really didn't get a, you know, a real in-depth. I was really more on the outside too because I was just doing video for him. Um, and plus it was my first year. And so I was just trying to soak everything in and not messing up. I mean, granted, I'm coming from being a professional coach to sitting in a dark room trying to learn sports code. And I'm like, the only thing I use my computer for is Skype and email. And so that alone, I was already stressed. Um, but in terms of the coaching style, I think Vinny was very um, like open to allowing them to play in their space, like CP. He had a lot of like um, sets for CP and Blake um, and kind of let like CP do a little bit more of the kind of coaching and call playing where Doc um, did about, I would say about even, uh, with CP. So I think that was like the biggest thing. Um, Vinny was just always around, always, um, just cracking jokes, you know, just, I just remember the environment was really loose where Doc, um, brought in more of like the work ethic, the focus, um, which is again, it's good or bad, but it's their personality. And so I think that was the biggest difference, but gr both great, um, head coaches and shoot, they gave me the opportunity. So I can't thank them enough. Yes. One last question before we move on from the Clippers. Uh, mm -hmm. How did you adjust your coaching style between Lob City and the Kawhi PG more defensive team? <laughs> well, it was my, it wasn't my team. You know, I was only an assistant coach. And so, um, you know, it was just, it was just different. Like you have to adjust between what your stars are really great at. I mean, CP is one of the most elite passers you know, in basketball history. And so of course you're gonna have that type of a uh, little bit of a showcase type factor. I mean, cause he could place it wherever, you know, the other players, DJ and Blake, wherever they needed, he was gonna give it to them. And then, I mean, for PG and Kawhi, I mean, they played both sides of the floor. Um, you know, they're just different. They're more, uh, to, I mean, they stay on the ground more. They, they're not, you know, they're dunkers when they have to be dunkers. Um, and so again, you got to go with what your stars are capable and putting them in the best position to win. Can you give us a recap of how you met T Man and how your relationship grew over time? <laughs> uh, when did I meet T Man? Oh, some, was it summer league? Okay, now I'm like blanking. Uh, well, it was summer uh, training camp. No, it wasn't training camp. Sorry, I'm going back again. We actually were rent, we were using a high school because we were do redoing the facility. So I just remember him coming in. Um, very quiet, like just really quiet. Um, he had, you know, his hair was out to here. Um, and then him and Fee came in together. And so they're like, oh, these guys are already friends. And it was like, okay. So it was good for them to come together because I think it, it both allowed them to ease into our, you know, the situation of being a rookie. Um, but I just remember one of our coaches saying, he's yours. T-Man is yours. And I was like, okay. Um, and what impressed me with Terrence was after his workout, you know, he was just kind of hanging out and most players, like once they're done, they just leave, like they automatically leave. And I just remember him saying like, cause I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm waiting for feet. And I'm like, why are you waiting for feet? And he goes, well, I have to take him home. And I'm like, he don't have a car. Like I just, it was so different because most of our players have cars, they do their own thing. Like that's just normal NBA, but Terrence and Fee, they had such a close relationship and that, which they still do. And I just love the fact that Terrence was like, look, like it's my responsibility right now to, you know, take care of him, uh, make sure he gets, gets home, just those things like that. And I'm like, wow, like this kid is really going to be, he's going to be great. I mean, he already had that care factor of being a great teammate, but just being responsible and not just being within himself. I mean, a lot of players get lost 
within themselves and, and making the NBA and kind of just doing their own thing. But no, T-Man showed a maturity level that I was like overly impressed with on day one. Yeah, absolutely. The Noel family is very strong. This interview has been great so far. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to be talking about the Las Vegas Aces 2022 WNBA championship run. Don't go anywhere. So I know a lot of our listeners are in the full fantasy football mode right now. So I'm going to make this comparison for you. Uh, the NBA is more like your 14 team fantasy league is you got your two main stars and you find the right pieces to really complement those players. But the WNBA is only comprised of 12 teams, meaning each team is stacked. Can you talk about how the aces roster fits together and how all those pieces came together to create a championship team? Um, I'd say Becky Hammond <laughs> as our leader. <laughs> Um, I mean, she was a lot more experienced than I was with the with the W. So just coming into this being my first season as, you know, a coach, but her first season as a head coach, um, I was grateful that she knew um, what we were walking into. But, um, you know, having that many capable shooters, uh, scores, um, she knew how to navigate. And it was, I remember her first sit down we were in the airport and she was just like, I'm going to have one-on-ones with all the players, like each individually. And I'm going to let them know that what their role is. And right then and there, I was like, Oh, she's, she's locked. She's already locked in. She's already, already going to tell them like, this ain't your team. Like this is not your team. Like at the end of the day, it, it's everyone's team. And um, having those like real tough conversations of where they're used to saying, no, I'm the star. No, I'm the star. Or, you know, I want 20 points or I want 20 shots. Like, that wasn't gonna fly. And just by her experience from the NBA and just from her, her playing days, like she knew she had to organize them um, from the jump. And from there, it just, you know, we took off. Now, one of the things Becky Hammond definitely brought over from her time in the NBA is the idea of shooting more three-pointers and being more efficient. So the Aces shot 12.9 more three-pointers per game than the previous year under Bill Ambeer, set a WNBA record with 23 threes and a first-round victory over Phoenix, led the league in scoring with 90.4 points per game. That's more than any team has had in 12 years. They run a real pace and space style of offense. So who are some of the best shooters in the WNBA that you think deserve more shine than they get and people might not know about? Mm. Could I say our players or does it have to be? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. I mean, we have, I think, some of the top-notch shooters. I mean, Kelsey Plum, we already know. Um, Chelsea Gray came on um, more towards the end uh, of the season because she was just warming up. She didn't want to give it all. She didn't want to give it away at the beginning. Uh, Jackie Young improved her shooting. Uh, obviously, Raquana Williams showed that she can close games. Uh, so I'm always rolling with what, what we got. Asia Wilson obviously improved her shooting. And uh, I mean, I got to give credit always to Diana Tarasi. I mean, she's the GOAT. And we had always a very special uh, defensive scheme against her, um, which means absolutely no threes. And so, and then we'd roll with whatever was going to happen. But um, for sure, uh, those were on the top of my list. And for some reason, um, um, it's like not clicking right now. Um, but, uh, Marina from Dallas, she was a really good, uh, three point shooter. Yeah. So you talked about Chelsea Gray a little bit and we like Chelsea Gray's game a lot is the kids these days say she got that dog in her. <laughs> so you tell us a little bit about Chelsea's game and what her work ethic is like day in and day out. Cause she always seems ready for those big moments. Well, Chelsea is one of those, um, one of those players where like, she loves it. You know what I mean? And you guys, I'm sure watching the NBA, you like you could tell who loves it, who kind of does it, you know, as a, as a job, who kind of does it just for the life. Like you can see it. She loves it. And so you can't get her out of the gym. I mean, she enjoys doing extra shooting. Um, she did a lot of shooting with one of, uh, with our player development coach, Tyler, um, who made sure he held her accountable with getting shots up. Um, even I think doing a quicker release, I think just especially for her outside shooting. Um, but when you have a player that loves it, like all you do is you continue to add and you continue to push. So when you push a player that wants to be great, I mean, that's pretty much the results. You know what I mean? What you guys saw. And to us, we, we had no idea. I didn't, I didn't know. I was just, you know, sitting on the sidelines enjoying the show just as much as you, you guys were. But I mean, in the last two rounds, we we're like, oh shit, that's going to go in. 
oh shit, that's going, oh shit, that is going, like we knew everything was going to go in, but we thought it was going to stop, but it never did. So it was just unbelievable. And we have so many, so many fans, like all my family, friends, all my, MB, all the NBA players I know, they're like, we're a Chelsea Gray fan. So. I'm a Chelsea Gray fan too. I got to get this out. I'm watching these aces, the well, the aces versus storm series and Stewie on one side is going off. Oh. Stewie's like Katie with like the head fakes, the dribble pull-ups, like just the package that she has and her playing style, her shot selection is really good. And then you have Chelsea Gray on the other side, matching her bucket for bucket. And the thing about Chelsea Gray is she's not one of those people who running down the court, saying all this stuff, trash talking. She's going on the court, just stone cold, just r running down after every bucket, knowing I'm about to come down for the next possession and do the same exact thing. All the buckets were contested. I don't know what it is. They were all contested. They were all falling. And I think at one point she had like six buckets in a row. But that mm -hmm. brings me into my next question, which is coaches are an integral part of a championship team. And just a few seconds that go either direction can shift an entire series. So let me set the stage real quick. It's game three of the WNBA semifinals. The Aces are playing the Storm. The series is tied 1-1. Sue Bird hits a corner three to put the Storm up two with 0.2 seconds remaining in regulation. Becky Hammond and the Aces call a timeout, and she draws up one of the best inbound plays I've seen to give Jackie Young an easy look to force OT, take me through the conversation going in that huddle during that timeout because I'm watching that and I'm saying, wow, Sue Bird, her last season, she just pulled off a huge, huge swing game win and you guys off a great inbound tied up to go to OT. So what's funny was um, I went to go visit Becky um, before you know our training camp because again, none of us knew each other. Me, Tyler, Becky, CT, Rich, like we didn't know each other. Um, so Becky was like, hey, come visit me. Well, you know, cause I, I stopped working a little bit before she did. And so she's like, come visit me. I was like, all right, cool. Went to watch her, you know, um, coach in San Antonio. And then all of a sudden after the first quarter pop gets ejected and I'm like, oh shit. I was like, this is gonna be great. You know what I mean? Like I get to see Becky like live, like, um, and it was her scout. So she got to take it and she drew that play. And I was like, oh my God, that play works like, like clockwork. And it, it wasn't, it wasn't a close game, but she drew it like end of the clock. And I'm like, man, that thing works like, you know? And so as the season went on, she drew it up a couple of times, like during practice. And she actually drew it one time during um, a close game, like two months prior to that, prior to the playoffs. And um, God, it was so, I could see clear as day. So the game went back and forth, like, just like you said, and um, we made a mistake defensively. And I'll, I'll take the credit on making the mistake because I got phone calls from Sam Cassell, Armand Hill, Doc Rivers, T. Lou, like everybody was like, Nat, why in the fuck did you let that corner three happen? Because in the league, like you never give up that corner. Like that's the one spot you force the ball to the top, right? And so I did tell Kia, I told her to like wave her hands, but I didn't tell her to like, do not give, so that's on me. So as, you know, the ball goes, we figured it was going to go to Stewie, but for some reason, you know, Sue got loose and all of a sudden I see that ball go to the corner. I'm like, where in the fuck is that ball going? <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And then all of a sudden Sue has it. And then she like, you know, she laces it for a second. I'm like, I'm like, okay. And then she, she nails it and the crowd goes crazy. Right. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, all right. I look up, it says 0.8. And on the TV, it said 1.8. I don't know why it did, but it said 0.8. And I was like, oh, I was like, too much time. And so it was crazy. Like, we all knew. Like, I think we all took a breath. Like, oh, 0.8. I'm like, Becky already, she's got it. So we all huddled up. And she's just like, mm-hmm. She's like, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm about to draw that. <laughs> like, she knew. And we're like, great. And she already drew a play for, for Bay, Raquana. She already drew a play for Asia. And so she's so great in time like how the defense is guarding, like guarding. Um, and we knew Seattle d did like to switch. I mean, sorry, they did like to stay. They don't switch, which is crazy to me. Um, but then she said, by, since we scored twice already, she's like, they're going to switch. And I was like, all right. I was like, draw that play. I mean, here comes that play, you know, because all we need, we didn't need that much time. And she drew it up for Jackie. And we're all like, oh, this is going to work. Like, it was crazy, but we're all like, this is going to work. 
And as soon as they get through the ball and I, the ref stood right in front of me and I was pissed. I was like, man, I can't even see it. But once um, Jackie turned that corner and Ezzy like went for KP, I was like, oh, she's open. And, and like Chelsea threw that dime and just, and laid it in her hands. Because when we ran it like a month ago, Chelsea actually threw it at Asia's feet. And so that's why it was so good. Like all that stuff happened a month ago and we didn't execute it because we all knew like, we know how to execute it now. You know what I mean? So once that ball hit Jackie's hands, Jackie just put it up for some reason. As he pulled her arm back, they had a foul to give. I know that would have been weird, um, you know, to do that, but you can foul. Like as the ball goes, you actually can foul, but they didn't foul and she put her hands down. So um, good for us. And uh, yeah, Jackie made it and we just went crazy. Like 0.8, too much time. <laughs> So I saw an interview question. It was post game. I forgot what game it was. I think it was with the Sun in the finals or the Storm, where Chelsea Gray was asked about how they have a defensive game plan for the Storm or for the Sun. And she said, I can't give you guys that secret during the series because uh, mm -hmm. I can't um, give that away. What was it? Now that the series is over, what was your game plan? We, we junked it up a lot. Becky likes yeah. to junk it up. I mean, the greatest thing with, with Becky is like, she's not afraid to here's a game plan and she's not afraid to go away from it and just, yeah. and then change it on the fly. Like as coaches, like, and this comes from the, her ability of being a hall of famer and being a great coach. Like I'm a big believer now that you had to have played professional basketball. If you want to coach professional basketball, I'm just going to say it because how she's able to see things and adjust on the fly and say, Hey, this is going to work. Like you have to have gone through that. You had to experience that, you know? So um, she junks it up. Like she'll call, we went triangle and two, sometimes we went box and one, sometimes we went zone. We went, we went small. We went big. like, like Becky just, you know, she knows when to do it. It's just not about, okay, here's the game plan, but she knows the time uh, of when it's going to be effective. And that is why she's great. So, so last but not least, we've got to show some love to the MVP of the league, Asia Wilson. She's only 26 and she's already a two time MVP. WNBA champion, defensive player of the year, four-time All-Star. She won Rookie of the Year, Commissioner's Cup champion, NCAA champion, and most outstanding player, Consensus National Player of the Year, SEC Freshman of the Year, and three-time SEC Player of the Year. Can you talk to us a little bit what it's like being around her and her game and how she impacts both sides of the court? So Asia, when I first met her, like she's the most humble person, humble MVP of I've ever met in my life. And I didn't even know she was, you know, going to play like the way she played this year. Um, but she's just super humble and she cares so much about her teammates that all these accolades, I would have never known she, she received them already. I would have never known. Um, she's always about putting the team first and she's always about having a good time. Like I won't forget um, our first game versus Phoenix. And granted, this, this is my first game, Becky's first game. Like, this is everyone's first game. It was pretty intense. Phoenix sold out crowd away, right? I was like, well, this is like a playoff game. All of a sudden, we're in the huddle, and Asia just hears a Beyonce song, and then she, like, drops it like it's hot. And I'm like, I'm like, wait a second. I was like, wait a second. You know, I'm like, I'm used to NBA players, and I've never seen an NBA player, like, drop it like it's hot. And I hit Jackie and I'm like, Jackie, I'm like, what is this? And she goes, oh, this is how she gets ready. And she, and I'm like, really? And she goes, yeah. And then she's like, when I hear Beyonce, she goes, I got to drop it. And I was like, oh, okay. And so like, like they just, you know, she also loves to have a lot of fun um, and she doesn't take things too seriously. And I think that's why she is able to win all these awards is because she's always so um, authentic and real all the time. And I think that's why people love her. And I think that's why she's successful just in life. You know? Yeah. So to end off, before we started this, I asked you about the party and how you guys were celebrating the WNBA championship. For our listeners, give us the 48-hour play-by-play after the championship game. Just let us know about how that whole uh, two, days, two days went. <laughs> just, I mean, again, just for a lot of these players, too, um, they're very strict about like food, diet, sleep, drinking, like they are, majority of them are. And I think, so just to have that, just, you know, once we're done, just have all this alcohol um, available 
um, and just, again, they deserve it, you know, for all the things that they sacrifice, all the hard work and all the things that they had to learn on the fly. Like we taught them this whole new, you know, terminology and plays and defensive schemes in like four months, four and a half months. So credit to them of like being open-minded. And so it was just a lot of drinking, you know, whatever your choice of drink was, you got it. Um, and then just a lot of dancing. These girls dance all the time, whether it's like in a plane or after the game in the locker room or just on their IG, they're doing something, something live. Like you've seen Sydney Colson. I don't know if you guys know um, our girl, Sydney Colson. I mean, that girl is crazy on her IG live, but, um, but yeah, just, just a lot of drinking, I'd say, and a lot of celebrating and, and having family and friends around. Yeah, all the dieting and drinking rules completely got thrown out of the window after that. <laughs> of course. And, and again, they deserve it, you know. So whatever they got, I mean, it was there. It was right there at their hands. And then, like, when we went on the bus, it was it was there again. And um, But again, like, it's from what they, they've earned it. You know, these girls have really put in a lot of work and, and um, a lot of energy that we asked from them. So, yeah. Well, like I said in the intro, you said you didn't want to coach. You wanted to win championships also. You did just that. So thank you for coming on. Let's start these sign-offs. Cam, thank you for coming on with us today. What's going on? Yeah, thanks again for doing this with us. Uh, always a pleasure. But uh, as far as Florida State this weekend, Boston College, Saturday night. Spread is currently 17 and a half. You're going to place your bets. Use our code LEAVE on prize picks. Uh, if Travis plays, it'll probably move to 20. So go ahead and put that in before. Uh, yeah, thank you again. Yeah, and then Ak, you're very excited to go to this FSU game. Who do you think is going to pull it out? Do you think we're covering the spread, or do you go with the uh, with, with the metrics on this one? Oh, this is a tough one for me because we don't know if Chav is playing, right? So I think that's a lot of what it comes down to. I'm staying away from this one personally, but if I had to put it on one thing, I would bet on the under. Uh, so keep that in mind as you're looking out for this. Also, keep a lookout for the FSU women's soccer team, ranked number seven in the country, playing a home game against Louisville. Big conference matchup tonight. Uh, can't wait to see what the final score of that one is. I have faith in our girls. We're going to pull it out, though. So, again, keep on the lookout for that. And if you see me and Cam out this weekend in Tallahassee, come say hi. Let's have a good time. Absolutely. And then last but certainly not least, Coach Natalie Nasake, thank you for coming on and spending this time with us. We know you're going on vacation soon. So, <laughs> Get away from all social media and drink a lot more. Thank you for coming on. <laughs> I will. No, it's now it's detox time, but thank you guys. Thanks for your time. Absolutely. So like Cam said earlier, if you want to put your bets in, use the code leave on prize picks. Quick score update for you in the FSU soccer game. They just scored 50 seconds ago to go up four to one. So big lead early second half there. Another W for our girls. I got nothing else to say until next time. Keep interacting with us and thank you to our listeners for so much uh, support can't thank you guys enough until next time peace